Welcome to Cantini. Uh, from being out in the um, in the lobby the last couple of minutes, uh, I, th I think I'm almost to the point where I know every person here. I <laughs> feel like I've talked to all of them. So it's delighted. Uh, we, I am delighted. We are all, all delighted to have you all here. Uh, my name is Paul Herbert. I'm the director of the First Division Museum at Cantini. This is not the First Division Museum. This is the Visitor Center. Normally we have these in the First Division Museum, but we have a wonderful exhibit there on World War I propaganda uh, in the space that we would normally use, and that's why we're in the Visitor Center, and we hope that you'll uh, come over and, uh, and see that uh, uh, when the museum is open. Uh, in case you are new to Cantini, and I think that's probably few of us, but some of us, uh, this is the historic estate of the late Colonel Robert R. McCormick, uh, who was the owner and publisher of the Chicago Tribune for uh, nearly 50 years. Uh, he lived here, his home is a museum and is open to the public. Uh, and uh, he became a multimillionaire uh, in, uh, as uh, a businessman running uh, the Chicago Tribune and the Chicago Tribune Company. Uh, second only to the Tribune in the Colonel's heart was the first division of the United States Army in which he served as a citizen soldier in World War I and uh, quite famously uh, participated in America's first battle in Europe and the first battle of World War I, America's first battle of World War I at Cantini, France. And when he came home from the war, he, he named this place Cantini. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, he named this place Cantini to honor the battle and he was a a uh, friend of soldiers and veterans for the rest of his life. Okay, now some folks are shaking their heads at me. Um, can you hear me in the mic? Okay. No. In the back? Yes, yes. How about now? Uh, 
So, without further ado, it is my great personal privilege to welcome to the stage Professor John McManus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my <laughs> thank you Paul. Appreciate it very much. Uh, thank, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out tonight. Uh, it, it means a lot to me, and I, I appreciate it. Um, Cantini is one of my favorite places on earth. Uh, love this place. It's beautiful, of course. It's, uh, it's serene in its own way. For an historian, it is a playpen of the first order because um, anyone who's interested in the, the operational side of the U.S. Army or any other side of the U.S. Army has to come here. Um, it is a remarkable institution. Colonel McCormick has, has done some work whose legacy remains with us today. And I just want to, uh, I just want to thank uh, many of uh, the, the, the folks who work here because in the end that's what makes Cantini and uh, the museum so special is the staff. Uh, J.D. Comis who did a, a lot of the arrangements uh, to, to make this evening a success. Um, I want to convey my appreciation to him. Um, Eric Gillespie, his uh, McCormick Research Center is really one of the leading military archives on the planet and I know that firsthand from spending a lot of time here and spending a lot of time in other places doing research. This is, uh, this is first rate. Andrew Woods, uh, who's the research historian there, and was sort of a, a kind of a collaborative partner for me uh, during the, the research and writing of this book because uh, no one knows more about the history of the First Division than Andrew. I've called him a wizard and I'm standing by that. He truly is. Those of you who have dealt with him know what I mean. Um, so I just wanted to thank him tonight because without him uh, there wouldn't be this book. And of course, my friend Paul Herbert, uh, as he said, this book kind of started over a, because of a conversation he and I had about two and a half years ago. Uh, he's been a great sounding board, a great friend, uh, also a great partner, uh, has, has supported this uh, beyond my wildest dreams and was kind enough to invite me here to, to speak to all you good folks tonight. So um, I just wanted to convey my appreciation to them. Uh, this story I'll tell you. I think is, is uh, I, I'm just sort of the mouthpiece. Uh, it's their story as much as, as mine. And I think that it's fair to say uh, maybe the one thing that, that kind of unites us all here tonight is a, is a sort of an enduring fascination with the Normandy invasion uh, seven decades later. It is arguably the most famous event of World War II, uh, certainly in the Western world and in the United States. Um, and like all of us, I've been irresistibly drawn to it throughout much of my life, uh, really dating back to childhood. Um, but, you know, I, I've studied it a long period of time. Um, first as a young tourist, when I, when I got the opportunity to visit uh, Omaha Beach uh, with, with my parents, and was kind of enthralled, you know, that history could come to life that way. Because as Americans, we're not, uh, we're not able to, to just simply walk out the door and visit World War II battlefields. Uh, so this made it tangible to me and kind of fired up my imagination to study more. I also later on had the opportunity to study Omaha Beach in more depth as part of what was called the Normandy Scholars Program. This is when I was a graduate student. And it's a great program that four universities participated in, my own University of Tennessee and uh, Texas, Texas A&M, Texas Tech. Uh, and the capstone for this program was that you would spend about a month in Normandy, really, uh, you know, ex examining the culture, if that's what interested you, it was a team taught course, or the Battle of Normandy, and specifically for me, the invasion of Normandy in Omaha Beach. So, um, again, I started to learn more later on. I was a battlefield historian, uh, taking folks there, showing them around, and then eventually as an author. And what really stood out to me, and what kind of solidified uh, this thought that I'd had uh, firing around on the margins of my brain for years um, that was the, the aforementioned conversation with Paul that, um, you know, after many decades, after a lot of books, after an incredible amount of historical attention, there was still more to know and understand about Omaha Beach. Uh, and I think specifically, there was more to know about the First Division. Consider this. Um, Army historians in the aftermath of the Normandy invasion in the summer of 1944 did excellent combat interviews with the survivors. Uh, they wrote up 372 pages worth of material on the 29th Infantry Division, which, as you realize, I'm sure, uh, assaulted the western half of Omaha Beach and was technically under the, the uh, administrative command and control of the 1st Division on D-Day. Uh, 372 pages, another 300 pages on the Rangers, who, of course, assaulted uh, the western sector at Omaha Beach and, more famously, Point to Hawk. They did 83 pages on the Big Red One. 
And a lot of the subsequent history kind of followed that pattern. And I wouldn't claim that the Big Red One was unknown or overshadowed or forgotten. Not really quite that. Uh, but I do think that it was uh, not emphasized, its history was not emphasized as it should be to give us a full understanding of what happens at Omaha Beach. And so what excited me about this, especially after uh, really talking it over with Paul and investigating the sources myself, is there was a, new, a way to look at Omaha Beach with new eyes by looking at the experience of the First Division. And happily enough, there was just an incredible richness of sources. Um, the original combat interviews, the, the diaries, the letters, the, the after action reports, the unit journals, um, the after action critiques, uh, the, the letters that commanders uh, exchanged, um, the photographs, um, <clears throat> the diagrams. One of the really fascinating things to look at was the landing diagrams of how they planned this invasion and, and which unit was going to come in where, planned to the most minute detail. Um, all of this kind of stuff, again, kind of brings history to life. And of course, then the memoirs people had written, whether published or not, the diaries and the letters they had, uh, they had written, um, the, the oral histories that had been done by other historians, uh, such as the great Cornelius Ryan, uh, the questionnaires he had gathered, but also uh, interviews I had done over the years or correspondence that I had had with, uh, with veterans. I mean, so, so basically, I gathered uh, what I felt was every known source that, that could possibly be relevant. Uh, now, you never have everything you want, I suppose, but uh, I thought that I had an, an embarrassment of riches which could allow me to, to, to kind of write a book in which you could maybe immerse yourself into what the day might have been like as a first division soldier on D-Day. Uh, and so all this helped, I think, uh, answer some, some good questions such as why did the division succeed amid really terrible circumstances? Uh, what sort of personalities tended to triumph? What kind of uh, people led and what kind of people did not? Uh, what sort of decisions tended to lead to success? Um, what kind of impact did the, the First Division's fight at Omaha Beach have on Normandy as a whole? All these things are, are important questions that I think had been uh, underappreciated or less understood than, than perhaps they should have been. And, and really the place to start in understanding all this and answering the questions is to, to know a little something of the, the personality and the character of the Big Red One as of the spring in 1944. Um, of course, its, it's uh, uh, reputation was firmly established by then. It traced its lineage back to uh, the World War I era, of course, from which it, it derives its famous nickname and its famous patch, obviously. But in World War II, the division had fought in the Mediterranean. In North Africa and Sicily, it had carried out two amphibious invasions. It thought of itself as really the leading combat unit in the United States Army at the time. Um, it thought of itself that way. It was thought of at uh, command circles as a kind of a go-to unit in combat, a unit that gained ground, a unit that attained objectives, uh, a unit that could be counted upon uh, to, to do things that were positive when the chips were down. Uh, this was the positive side of the unit's reputation. Off the line was another story. <laughs> the Big Red One soldiers off the line had a reputation for being uh, tempestuous, rebellious, trouble-seeking and trouble-making, uh, you know, the, getting into fights and uh, liquor and all these kinds of things. Um, that, uh, you know, the discipline was, was a handful for this unit while off the line. This was the perception. Um, and uh, Major General Terry Allen, who was the commander in 1942 and 43, and beloved in the division, a, a very earthy uh, cavalryman who, who was very big on connecting with his soldiers um, and, and knowing them and understanding their mindset, uh, really not a career first kind of uh, officer. Uh, Terry Allen was beloved, uh, but he was held uh, responsible, I think it's fair to say, by many of his superiors for the supposed uh, lack of discipline and the, the kind of insular nature, nature and rebelliousness and uh, kind of let's feel sorry for ourselves perception of the Big Red One at that time. And so Generals Omar Bradley uh, and George Patton, uh, who were two of the, the, the most offended of, the, of any of the, the senior commanders of the Big Red One's supposed discipline issues, uh, helped maneuver Allen out with, uh, with Eisenhower's consent. Um, and I think that, you know, if you want to sort of sum up what, what bothers Bradley and Patton, 
uh, about the division. It's a sort of a famous saying that we still associate with the Big Red One to this day and did circulate around the division circa 1942 and 43, and I think it's fair to say afterwards. Um, it was often said within the division that the United States Army consisted of the Big Red One and 10 million replacements. <laughs> So you're like, hmm, mull that over, and you imagine you're, so, you know, and you're in the rest of the army, how are you going to think about that? And of course, there were other divisions that had a great claim to fame too, such as the 3rd Division, which had fought alongside the Big Red One, and so on and so forth. But that's part of unit esprit, believing you're the best, believing you can attain great things, believing you're something special. And the Big Red One had that in spades. Uh, and so, you know, Bradley and Patton are taking a little bit of a chance in the sense of, of changing beloved senior leadership. And I should have mentioned uh, they also fired Ted Roosevelt, who was the second in command, son of the, the president, obviously, uh, who would later emerge with the 4th Division and, and earn the Medal of Honor for his exploits at Utah Beach on D-Day. But uh, so these two guys were very popular in the division, so a lot was riding on Bradley's choice of a replacement. And it's, um, whoops, it's not that, it's this guy, Clarence Hubner, uh, another major general, all of 55 years old in uh, 1944. And he comes to the division in the, in the, uh, in the late summer of 43, uh, as a kind of a disciplinarian, uh, the contrast to, to the, the sort of lax, uh, folksy Terry Allen, uh, Hubner has this reputation of being a real martinet, uh, of being a really tough guy and, uh, and someone who doesn't put up with any nonsense. And so, uh, unfairly, the rumors sweep through the ranks that this is some stateside guy from a desk job that they've thrown at the division to get back at them because everybody's always out to get the big red one kind of thing and now they're really sticking it to us and this guy doesn't know anything. Well, um, the soldiers are very ignorant, and most of them, about Hubner's background. Uh, Clarence Hubner, uh, whereas, you know, Allen is kind of born to soldiering, he's the son of a military officer, um, Hubner is drawn to soldiering. He uh, comes from a Kansas wheat farming family. Uh, he was a uh, a uh, very good athlete. He was a school teacher as a very young man and decided, you know, this isn't for me. I am drawn to the Army. And he decides to, to join the Army as a private. Um, a, he rises up the NCO ranks before World War I. Uh, during World War I, he earns through a competitive process a, a commission in the United States Army. Uh, he deploys to France in World War I as a combat commander. And guess what division he was part of? Big Red One. Uh, Clarence Hubner comes out of World War I as arguably uh, the most accomplished and finest uh, uh, combat commander in the, in the entire American Expeditionary Force. He, he starts the war basically as a lieutenant, ends the war as a lieutenant colonel. Um, in charge of a regiment, albeit temporarily. He was badly wounded. He earns the Distinguished Service Cross. Uh, he fought in some of the toughest battles that Colonel McCormick would have been part of as well, would have known very well. Uh, Hubner, after the war, had served with the Big Red One as well uh, for, for uh, several years. And so he'd had a lot of experience with the division by World War II. It's just that the average soldier didn't necessarily know that. Uh, and when he comes to the unit and starts to say, hey, straighten up your uniform, salute your officers, shine your boots, all these kinds of things that are very unpopular uh, if you've been through combat. You know, you don't want to hear all the sort of uh, barracks kind of stuff anymore. Uh, Hubner is then very, very unpopular. In fact, he's hated. Um, and wh why has he insisted upon saluting officers? You don't do that in combat in World War II, right? Uh, well, the reason he has insisted upon that is he wants, it's an easy way for him to circulate around the division and see if orders are followed. Uh, because he has this thing in which, and he tells his officers, I found a, like a, 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 a minutes from a, a, a conference he had with his officers soon after taking command, and, and he basically tells them, you know, if you, wanna, you want people to follow orders, you got to follow through and make sure they do. Otherwise, it's like you never gave the order at all. So that's a sort of insight into why he tells people to salute. And he also believes that although he reveres Terry Allen, and he never undercuts him or cuts him down or anything, uh, he does think the division needs to, to kind of buck up in terms of its uh, care of weaponry and, and uh, care of uniforms and, and overall discipline in a way. But in the end, Hubner is about practical application of what's going to work in combat, uh, and in spite of what a lot of the soldiers had thought initially. Uh, his, his philosophy uh, is summed up by a, a quote that he likes to tell many of his officers uh, later in life, well after World War II. He basically says this way, and I think this is, this is very true if you think this over. He says, you know, in taking over a unit, you can start by being an SOB and then become a good guy, 
but you can never start by being a good guy and then become an SOB. <laughs> Very insightful, don't you think? Um, and, and I think that's basically what he is willing to do. He's going to be the tough love guy uh, until he gets the, the unit trained the way he wants him to. And, so when they go back to England, and they're not very happy about this, by the way, because uh, they felt they'd done their part in the Mediterranean. When they board ships and they're heading west, they're thinking, we're going home, we're going home, we're going home. And then reality hits. They take that northward turn, and they're going to England, of course, to lead another invasion. Uh, it's as obvious to anybody who's really thinking it through. And so, um, you know, once this dawns on guys, by the fall of 43 and the spring of 1944, uh, they are put through really intensive training by Hubner. Hubner is an unforgiving troop trainer, uh, and he is a near fanatic about weapons proficiency across the board, uh, knowing how to use all the weapons, use them well, clean them, care for them, and so on and so forth. And he doesn't just uh, talk the talk, he walks the walk. He's an expert uh, marksman. He demonstrates proper shooting for him to, to soldiers who are more than half his age. Um, he goes through the, the obstacle course. Uh, he, uh, during the, the anti-armor training, he's able to, he's, he's willing to, to put himself in a foxhole while a tank, you know, rolls over him. Uh, all these kinds of things he does along with the soldiers that he expects to get through this. And so, you know, in the spring of 44, I think it's fair to say that there, there's some begrudging respect for him in that sense, that, that he does kind of uh, you know, care and know what he's doing. As one, uh, one soldier kind of grudgingly uh, sidles up to, to one of Hubner's um, commanders, General Clift uh, Andrus, who was the division artillery commander one day, uh, the soldier kind of says to, to General Andrus, he says, you know, the old man knows his stuff. Uh, and I think that that's very apparent. Hubner is a real professional. He acquires the nickname the coach because that's his uh, persona. Uh, he's not going to humiliate you in spite of the Martinet reputation. He's not going to dress you down uh, or kind of challenge your manhood. He's going to coach you. He's going to instruct you. Remember, he was a teacher. And so he always has this kind of teaching and coaching style. Um, so he's trained his people to the point of uh, complete redundancy by the spring of 44, physical fitness off the charts, amalgamating new people uh, into the organization, uh, as I said, weapons, but of course, especially amphibious training, over and over and over again to the point where the troops wonder maybe if they've joined the Navy rather than the Army, you know? Uh, they're aboard ships so much that they know the naval crews of the various troop ships and whatnot. So um, they're trained, I think, one way to just get a sense of how, how heavily trained they are for an amphibious invasion is just to, to look at the boat teams them, or boat sections themselves. Uh, a typical Higgins boat has about 32 soldiers, an understrength platoon, um, and usually led by an officer, a, a lieutenant, a platoon leader, um, and then obviously as a platoon sergeant. Well, each person on that boat has a specific place they're supposed to stand. So it's not, you're not just sent in there randomly. And it's done according to, to how the assault is going to be uh, carried out. Your riflemen here, your mortar people here, your machine gunners here, your Bangalore torpedo teams, your satchel charge people, uh, all of this kind of stuff is choreographed. And uh, also, I tend to think, this is only, this is my opinion, but I tend to think they've set the leadership up the right way too. And you'll notice this if you look at pictures of uh, the, in the invasion at Omaha Beach from, from the vantage point of behind the troops as they're standing on the Higgins boats. Um, you'll notice that usually the guy at the front of the, the boat where, where the ramp is, uh, you'll notice the, the vertical hash mark uh, painted on the rear of his helmet that means he's an officer. Okay, he's in the lead. It's his job to lead off the boat, literally to lead and inspire and instruct. You know, uh, that's what he's supposed to do. Follow me, as they say in the, the infantry school. Uh, the guy in the back, you'll notice the horizontal hash mark painted on his helmet. That's his ranking NCO. He's the push man. He's the muscle. In other words, okay, if you're a little reluctant to get off this boat, you don't have that option. Go. <laughs> so he's in the back making sure everybody gets off. So if you've, like if you've ever heard about the, the airborne, the paratroopers kind of operated the same way. You'd have the, the ranking NCO at the rear of the stick on a plane to literally push people out. So um, this, I think, is one example of, of how this is set up pretty intelligently. Now, um, this is the, the, the sector of Omaha Beach where the 1st Division is going to invade. Omaha Beach is originally uh, dubbed Beach 46 by Allied planners, um, eventually codenamed Omaha, obviously. And you can see uh, basically how it's shaped in the 1st Division sector. Uh, it's about a four and a half mile, four and a half to five mile long beach in a crescent. Uh, and of course, it, you know, brooding over it is a prominent ridgeline, uh, cliffs, 
uh, gullies, ravines, uh, and then a very narrow beach that is quite rocky, as I'm sure you probably realize. Uh, so you can see there's three main sectors, Fox Red, Fox Green, and Easy Red. You can see the German obstacle belt. You can see the various German strong points. WN means uh, Widerstand's nest, which basically is like resistance nest or strong point. And you can see the, the major ones. Here's WN60 flanking all of Omaha Beach. And if you stand up there in WN60 um, today, you can get a wonderful viewpoint of the entire beach. And you can say to yourself, wow, any German who was up here is in a position to do major damage to, to the Allies. Um, some of the, the uh, most potent weapons they've got. Uh, you've got at least one 75 millimeter gun up here. Of course, many mortars and machine guns as well. Uh, WN61 is the closest German strong point to the actual beach and shale itself at, uh, at all of Omaha Beach. It's almost like right down there, just above the, the, uh, the embankments. I, don't, I wanna, won't call them dunes. It's like a rocky beach leading to an embankment and then uh, you know gullies and ravines and whatnot. What, what stands out about WN61, you have an H677 casemate, uh, concrete, what you often call a pillbox, um, and it, it uh, has an 88 millimeter pack gun in it. Now you'll often hear um, World War II veterans use the term 88 millimeters ubiquitously to mean all of German artillery. Uh, they're actually not that common, fortunately, uh, especially at Omaha Beach. There were two of them there, one here at WN61 and then one in the 29th sector and the, at Vierville in the extreme western edge. WN62 is the most prominent and heavily fortified of all the resistance nests. It has a couple of 75 millimeter guns. It's got uh, multiple machine guns. It's got concrete tunnels. It's got mortar positions. It's got 50 millimeter guns. Um, and of course, WN61, I should have mentioned, also has a 50 millimeter gun, very deadly to landing craft. Um, over here, WN64 has uh, uh, at least one anti-tank piece. It's got multiple machine guns. Uh, down here, WN65 has another H67, 677 casemate with a 50 millimeter gun. And those of you who have been to Omaha Beach, uh, you have probably seen this gun inside this pillbox, which still remains there quite prominently today. Uh, probably, though, the most potent weapon the Germans have is inland artillery. Uh, 24 105 millimeter artillery pieces, anywhere from about one and a half to three miles inland, all of which are pre sighted on every inch of this beach. And I'm just talking the first division sector for that artillery. Uh, I determined in my research that the, the first division side of Omaha Beach is probably defended by about 500 plus German soldiers, so there's really not that many of them there. Uh, you have, of course, elements of the 352nd Infantry Division, um, which surprises uh, Allied intelligence by being there. It shouldn't have. Uh, they knew it had moved on from San Lo, and Field Marshal Rommel's concept was to defend at the waterline. So it's not an accident that the 352nd, that portions of it are there on D-Day. That's a myth. Uh, it's by design, and they had been there for about two and a half, three months. Uh, also elements of the 716th Division, uh, which is composed not primarily, but largely of uh, Eastern Europeans impressed into service. So, uh, you know, not very valuable manpower for the Germans, okay? So uh, Omaha Beach is an extremely tough nut to crack in the sense of the fortifications and the mines and the obstacles, uh, but if you can crack that shell, then you can have some success. But, of course, that's a big if. Um, the pre-invasion bombardment is almost totally inadequate, uh, really next to useless. The, uh, the uh, Air Force bombs Omaha Beach, but they, they drop their bombs inland, uh, doing really no damage at all. The naval bombardment is confined to 45 minutes, uh, which is nowhere near long enough, mainly because of the element of surprise. You know? So um, they do almost no damage. On the first division side of Omaha Beach, uh, I determined that two German soldiers were slightly wounded. Um, and then two flamethrowers that were over here on the eastern edge of WN62 were put out of action. Uh, and of course, this wasn't a pleasant thing for the Germans to be bombarded in this way, but in terms of doing real damage and helping the assault troops, it did next to nothing. Uh, so when you're a Brigadier run soldier going in uh, at 6.30 in the morning, uh, which is more or less low tide on D-Day, um, you are basically hitting untouched fortifications. Um, now, 16th Infantry Regiment receives the honor of going in first uh, for the Big Red One. Uh, this was another go-to unit, a unit with a fabulous lineage, of course, dating back, back many decades. Uh, they, are, they are to have two battalions assault uh, here in the, between WN62 and 64, right there at Easy Red. Um, and then the third battalion over here uh, to, to deal with Fox Green. Um, well, 
uh, as I'm sure you realize, uh, almost nothing goes according to plan. Um, and the assault on Omaha Beach, the seizure of it, uh, is such a, a large and compelling story. We could talk about it for days, but so, you know, not repeat ourselves, but I'll just focus on a few highlights. Um, um, for the rest of the story, you have to read the book, you know. So there's my, there's my agenda. It'll come back again and again, make no mistake. <laughs> so we'll touch on some of the highlights. Um, the planners know that the, the assault troops need fire support. You're sending two infantry battalions in here on a fairly heavily fortified beach. Uh, your main support is going to come from amphibious tanks. Uh, tanks that are designed what are called DD, duplex drive, or swimming amphibious tanks. Um, supposed to be a surprise weapon. They will be launched at sea about three miles offshore, ideally, and then swim in, uh, land right as the assault troops are landing, and then lay down fire. You, uh, you're supposed to have all of your boat sections land at the same time to present the Germans with so many targets that they'll, they'll be overwhelmed. Uh, it's supposed to be this, this synchronicity to the whole thing. Okay? Now you also have specially uh, trained and composed uh, gap assault teams of engineers, Navy and Army. And this was a product of uh, Allied uh, photo reconnaissance intelligence in the months leading up to D-Day. As of about March, there's a sense of just how much the Germans are fortifying Omaha Beach uh, with obstacles especially and with some mined obstacles, but also more mines all up here to cover the dead spots in their defenses. Uh, so they put together, the, the generals do, uh, combined Navy and Army teams of these engineers uh, to deal with the mines and obstacles. In fact, about one out of every four of the soldiers who goes ashore uh, in the morning of, uh, of D-Day at Omaha Beach is an engineer. Uh, you've got your intrinsic engineers uh, from the Big Red One. You've got these other guys and all that kind of stuff. So um, basically the Navy is supposed to deal with everything that's under the water. And the Army guys deal with everything that's not under the water. You've come in at low tide so that you can see the obstacles in front of you. The theory being, if you're at high tide, well, then it's tougher for the, the, um, the boat coxswains to see the mines and the obstacles, and they're going to have some problems. So uh, that's why you're in at low tide. The good news is you can see them. The bad news is you're, you're probably not going to be able to deal with them because of the heavy fire coming down on you. And the other bad news, you're looking at about 400 to 500 yards of open beach that you're going to assault here, straight into some pretty heavy firepower. Uh, so the other bad news, most of those swimming tanks never make it to the beach in the 1st Division sector. They came from the two companies of the 741st Tank Battalion. Uh, they are launched in, in uh, very heavy seas for, for what they're designed to do. As you know, I'm sure there was uh, you know, problematic weather that had forced the postponement to June 6 of the invasion. And the weather still wasn't that great on D-Day. It's cloudy and overcast most of the day. It's windy, uh, it's sea spray, and a little bit of mist and rain kind of thing. So um, these are very choppy seas, and you're, you're about five miles out now, not three. And um, the, the Army uh, tank commander, uh, Captain James Thornton, who was a, uh, a Citadel graduate, class of 1940, gives the go-ahead, yeah, let's launch instead of being carried in by the landing craft. It's a bad decision because uh, 27 out of 32 tanks sink. Um, three of the tanks made it in only because one of the, the, the tank mechanisms was damaged. They had like canvas skirts that would give them flotation. Uh, one of them was damaged, it was launching, so the crew just simply uh, put the ramp back up and then drove it in on an on a LCT or landing craft tank and landed those three tanks. Two others did succeed in swimming ashore, and uh, actually they're going to inflict major damage on the Germans. So in the meantime, though, the other 27 go down with an average of one crewman lost per tank, uh, almost all to drowning, as you could expect. Uh, there's one other company, though, that's, that's been planned to, to come in on the landing craft, and they make it ashore. So I would estimate that you've got about 16 out of 56 tanks that you're planning here. So they're, they're a player, but not quite what you expect. Um, the, the, you've got strong eastward currents that take the assault section boats in this direction. Uh, and so what that means is most of the boats are going to be mislanded. They're going to be mislanded in the place where you don't want to be landed right here under the nose of WN-62. Uh, right in a kill zone is where much of the 2nd Battalion, 16th Infantry comes ashore. 3rd Battalion lands about a half an hour, 40 minutes late uh, because of the confusion. Uh, so all of the timetable is blown. Uh, you've got uh, just, just all of this German firepower coming down on individual boats that are landing piecemeal. Um, one German machine gunner up here, uh, Heinz Saverlo, 
uh, claims to have shot 12,000 rounds from an MG-42 uh, machine gun in the course of the day, and I'm inclined to believe him. Uh, I think that that's a possibility. Uh, he's, he's in play for about half a day until about the mid-afternoon or so, uh, and he inflicts enormous damage. Uh, of course, the mortars and the artillery are inflicting more damage, really, more so than the machine guns. In fact, I would argue that Severlo's commanding officer, um, Lieutenant Bernard Freerking, who's in an observation bunker about right here, is probably the deadliest weapon they have because he's protected in a bunker and he's just calling down fire uh, with good communication for much of the morning and part of the day. Uh, and there again, the bombardment did not disrupt their communication. So uh, you've got that, and then when you do land as the Americans, uh, you're probably wet, you're tired, you're seasick. Um, you've been in the landing craft about two, three hours, very uncomfortable. You are uh, weighed down with way too much stuff. I think that's an American pattern in, uh, in modern combat, to put too much stuff on our troops. Uh, you've got about 70 or 80 pounds of stuff. Okay? And in a lot of cases, that's more than half your body weight of these guys. Um, you're wet and you're seasick. You don't feel like fighting. You are wearing, uh, in most cases, these um, specially impregnated uniforms that are supposed to be uh, gas resistant in case the, the Germans use poison gas. Um, they're uncomfortable, they're itchy, they don't breathe, and they stink like you wouldn't believe, like sour milk, uh, according to the testimony of the veterans. They call them skunk suits, um, <laughs> which, which I think was uh, you know, a pretty good term. Um, and you know what the postscript to this whole thing is that's, uh, it makes you shake your head. And I just found this out a few weeks ago. Um, and it, when, I, when I spoke at Fort Leonard Wood, which is the, the home to um, the Army's chemical branch, um, chemical weapons, it was a, a very grizzled uh, master sergeant who knew everything there was to know about chemical weapons and had studied this skunk suit. And he said, you know what? what I, from what I know about the chemicals used in the German gas that they had available at the time, if they had used their gas uh, at Omaha Beach, those suits would not have protected the American soldiers because when they got wet, the chemicals they were using in the skunk suits uh, would be neutralized. And so that's the irony of the whole thing. If the Germans had used the gas, those, those uniforms would have been next to useless uh, for protecting them. So this was just a debacle all the way around. Um, and I think just one example, one anecdotal example to understand the larger whole, PFC John McPhee. Young, strapping rifleman, peak of physical fitness. Uh, by the time he comes ashore and is dumped uh, somewhere here at Easy Red or Fox Green, uh, he is so sick, he's so dazed that he almost really couldn't care what happens. As he puts it later, I didn't care if Adolf Hitler was waiting for me. <laughs> I think that says it too. Uh, so instead of moving like rabbits, they stagger around like tortoises. So they are, they're really better targets. And um, the soldiers who survived in talking to Army historians said, we think we lost a lot of people because of that, because we were carrying too much stuff. And we think that was a real problem. Um, so low tide, 500 to 600 yards of open, obstacle, mine-infested beach, and you're trying to make it to the dubious shelter of what's called the shingle bank, kind of up here. And that's basically a raised bank of stones. Um, let me show you. Now, this is one of the really cool things about going to Omaha Beach in latter years. Stones like this, kind of smooth, almost polished stones. Uh, if you can imagine how slippery they would be as the tide comes in. Um, these stones, some of them are, are still there at Omaha Beach. And what's neat about this is that uh, you can go and you can look at some of these uh, rocks and see that they're still scarred from, uh, from ordnance that was presumably used on D-Day, like, like this one. Um, so here you are kind of taking cover at this, this kind of angled shingle bank. You've made it that far. You're exhausted. You're tired. Um, and as I said, it's slippery and hard to move around. But this is very dubious kind of shelter because uh, those, those hard rocks and stones, uh, when, when mortars and artillery shells come in, it's going to multiply the fragmentation effect. So you're not really safe. It creates the illusion of safety. Um, any exit is defended by barbed wire, uh, anti-tank ditches, mines, of course. The gap assault teams are just decimated uh, when they come in in trying to deal with all this. They're, they're mixed in with the infantry. It's a mess anyway. Um, they're getting shot up. Um, one of the problems that the gap assault teams have, besides being in this kill zone and being so vulnerable because they have a lot of explosives around, is um, a lot of times they will actually wire up the obstacles and, you know, and begin the process of blowing a gap in the obstacles. But the problem is uh, a lot of the infantrymen are taking cover behind those obstacles. And so obviously they're not going to blow them up with their own soldiers right there. 
And so that is another thing that helps neutralize the gap assault teams. Um, they're only able to, to forge a few gaps throughout the day. Um, they take over 45% casualties. Um, seven of the sailors earn the Navy Cross. 15 of the soldiers earn the Distinguished Service Cross. Uh, the, the casualties are terrible, as you can imagine. The trauma, of course, of this whole thing for everybody involved is basically off the charts. Um, just a few examples, and notice the toll on leaders. Uh, Lieutenant Aaron Denstadt, who was a, uh, who was a new platoon leader, boat section leader in F Company, 16th Infantry, and uh, he was, believe it or not, he was well liked um, because he tended to listen to his men. He was kind of down to earth. He was humble. Uh, his sergeant liked him, Sergeant Andy Nesevich, um, and everybody called him Lieutenant Denny. He had once attended UCLA, uh, and you know he, he basically is determined to lead. Uh, he takes about five, six steps off his landing craft. He's hit in the head with machine gun fire and killed almost instantly. Earns a silver star, though, for his valor. Um, and I found in the, in the Army archives a letter from his mother about a year, uh, two years after D-Day, writing to Army historians, urging them to tell the story of Denstead's unit at Omaha Beach. And she concluded her letter and said, I am just the proud mother of an only son. And if the story isn't included, I will try to understand. It's the kind of thing when you read that, you, you decide that story has to be told. Uh, so Denstead can live on in that respect. Um, not far away, Sergeant Joe Zakowski and his mortar section uh, got off their landing craft and were showered with German 50-millimeter uh, mortar fire. Three of his men were immediately killed. He was mortally wounded um, while he passed the mortar site on to the ranking sergeant. Uh, and uh, not realizing the mortar site was destroyed by fire as well. Uh, elsewhere on the beach, Zakowski's brother Edward uh, lay badly wounded from a mine, though he would survive. They were part of the same company, believe it or not. Um, PFC Norman Speckler uh, was carrying a, uh, a uh, satchel charge, a TNT satchel charge on his back. Something detonated it. Um, and I, I apologize for the, the graphic nature of this, but it, what happened is that it, it literally blew him into pieces. Um, Speckler's buddies uh, saw this happen right in front of them uh, and then had to crawl through the remnants in order to even get off Omaha Beach. Um, and as one of them, Private William Funkhauser later put it, um, uh, you can't even imagine how scared I was. Um, one interesting postscript to this. I got an email a few weeks ago uh, by a French gentleman who, who uh, tends to Speckler's grave in the Normandy American Cemetery overlooking Omaha Beach. And, uh, you know, this is a great honor for, for uh, the French to do this, and he's been taking care of Speckler's grave for many years. And he wondered if I knew anything about the background uh, of this man and what had happened to him. And though the story wasn't pleasant, I was able to, you know, from researching this, at least tell him something of who Speckler was and what had happened to him and how he had died on D-Day. Um, Lieutenant Edmund, Edmund Duckworth was the uh, executive officer of E Company 16th Infantry. Five of the six boats from that uh, company came in right here in the worst of the kill zone and were decimated. Um, he had gotten married just a few weeks before to his British girlfriend, Audrey Travers, um, and what he thought was a covered spot on the beach near the, near the shingle bank. Um, he took out a, a bottle of scotch and shared it with uh, Staff Sergeant Ben Talinda and another man. Um, Duckworth then chanced a, a look inland over, over the embankment uh, to see what was ahead. And as Talinda recalled, a sniper got him in the temple, scattering his brains on the other fellow and me. Um, one after action report, kind of summarizing all this up, wrote with what I think was grisly brevity, the water reddened with their blood. Um, the survivors were pinned down, uh, many of them at the water line, uh, right in here. Uh, where this was still under heavy fire. Um, others were, of course, um, wounded at the shingle bank, crouching behind the obstacles, whatever the case would be. Um, but one of the most dangerous jobs you could have at that point on D-Day morning was to be a medic, uh, to circulate around and go and try and drag the people. Often the wounded were at the water line. They couldn't continue. So drag people, in this case, and this is unusual, you're dragging wounded people toward the enemy rather than away from the enemy, and to get them, again, to the dubious cover of the shingle bank. And this took enormous courage and enormous strength, because people were heavy, they were wet, they're sandy, they're wounded, and many of them are kind of dead weight anyway, some of them unconscious. 
Um, this was a terrifying circumstance, uh, but I, I found no recorded instances of medics who refused to go. Maybe there were, uh, you know, you would think so, but uh, instead there were all sorts of accounts in the records about people who had gone to, to retrieve people. One of the best examples, PSC Charles Shea from F Company of the 16th Infantry Regiment, uh, circulates at the waterline for much of that morning, uh, dragging people, and he never even remembered how many, dragging them uh, up the beach and to, to what he hoped was better safety and some level of medical care. At one point, he came upon uh, one of his fellow medics from his company, Private Edward uh, Morosevic, who was dying from a terrible belly wound, and they both knew it. I spoke briefly, Shea bandaged his wound, uh, gave him a shot of morphine, and as Shea later put it, said, I knew there was no help for him. I said goodbye to him, and we parted forever. Morosevich is also buried uh, at the Normandy American Cemetery. Uh, one of the real frustrating things for the medics in the course of the day was the inability to evacuate badly wounded men. Um, you, that's what you want to do if you're a medic, patch them up and get them out there to, to more permanent medical care, perhaps for surgery or whatever. Well, at Omaha Beach, this was extremely difficult because uh, planners had earmarked very little shipping for medical evacuation. Most of the shipping is bringing in reinforcements, bringing in more uh, vehicles, more artillery pieces. In fact, honestly, a lot of things that were useless for what was going to happen at Omaha Beach, especially the artillery, which fires a, a grand total of, I don't know, a dozen rounds or something in the course of the day. Um, there's very little shipping earmarked to medical evacuation, which I personally feel was a major oversight and cost quite a few lives. So if you were wounded at Omaha Beach, you were probably going to have to lie there the rest of the, the day and the night and maybe not even be evacuated for a couple of days, depending upon your situation. Many was the time that the medics uh, had treated somebody, uh, found an empty uh, landing craft with a coxswain uh, at the helm, uh, leaving the beach and said, hey, you know, evacuate my guys. And then the, the, the coxswains would refuse. The medics unfairly would accuse them of cowardice. It wasn't that. It was because they had strict orders to continue on to go back on this timetable to go and get more people so that uh, you could continue the timetable and the landing operations the way everything had been planned. Um, now, amid all the carnage and the terrible things I've told you, believe it or not, some humorous things were going on too. There was a little levity. Uh, one example I would give you, PFC Lee Hamlet uh, was an L Company of the 16th Infantry, which was slated to, to come in here. He came in late, as I had mentioned, um, and he was a new guy in his platoon. And he felt like he was the only Southerner in a platoon full of Yankees. Uh, he came from Virginia. And his sergeant had derisively nicknamed him General Lee. His, nickname, his, his name was Lee, right? <laughs> so he's called General Lee. So they're coming in late, as I mentioned. Uh, Hamlet uh, is, is standing alongside his sergeant on the Higgins boat. And he kind of peeks over the, the side to take a look at you know, what they're about to, to land in. And the sergeant notices this. He immediately comes to attention and snaps off a salute and says, what do you see, General Lee? You know, like, <laughs> everybody cracks up on the boat. Um, but Hamlet didn't think it was too funny because he thought, oh my god, you know, the Germans are going to see him saluting me and think I'm someone important. They're going to kill me. <laughs> so he assaults his sergeant right there. <laughs> He's like, you no good, you know, and he assaults the sergeant right there. They, everybody has to break them up and then lower the landing, lower the ramp and, you know, attack the Germans. Uh, but, you know, it was this <laughs> rare moment of levity. Um, now, how is all this eventually resolved? Well, obviously getting off the beach, right? Uh, getting off the beach is of paramount importance. These are some of the first inland penetrations you see on the first division side of Omaha Beach. Uh, obviously, the timetable's blown, your situation's bad, the invasion's in critical condition. Uh, you know, there isn't all that much good happening for the first two to three hours, except for um, two, the two DD tanks that I had mentioned that actually swam ashore. Um, Staff Sergeant Turner Shepard and Sergeant George Geddes. Uh, those tanks administer major damage on WN-61 and WN-62. One of them knocks out the 88 millimeter gun uh, at about 7 in the morning, and another knocks out the two 75 millimeter guns uh, that, are, that are up here at, um, at WN-62. Um, but the, the penetrations are not from the tanks, obviously, it's from uh, the foot soldiers. So uh, you start to see groups in the course of the morning, uh, either through luck or pluck or courage or whatever, circumstances, uh, whatever, getting off the beach and penetrating inland. Just a few examples. Lieutenant William Dillon uh, and a group from A Company of the, the 16th. Okay, Dillon um, 
and his guys uh, blow their way uh, through barbed wire and mines using a Bangalore torpedo, basically a long tube of explosives designed to, to, to blow holes. Um, and that's a common way for American soldiers to get off Omaha Beach on D-Day. So he and his guys do this, but the problem is then you have to penetrate a, an anti-tank ditch, flooded marshy lands, and then a lot of mines. See, that's how the Germans are protecting the dead spot in their defenses is a lot of mines. And you can conceal them in these kind of wavy, ravine-like grasslands you've got at Omaha Beach. Um, and there's no, there's no developed roads of any real significance in the bigger one sector. Uh, you just have these naturally eroded ravines that'll serve as beach exits. So um, Dylan is looking for a, a path off the, the uh, you know, inland off the beach and up the bluffs. He loses two guys to mines on the way up, two guys killed. Um, and he, Dylan in civilian life before World War II had been quite a rabbit hunter. And so he knew trails and he knew that uh, how to sniff them out and where trails would be, where they would logically be. Um, and so <clears throat> he decides the Germans have to have trails here because they had to have gotten off the beach somehow and they're not going to hit their own mines. So he finds one such trail and this is one of the first groups of A Company to, to come in here and start to flank behind the Germans. Another group under Staff Sergeant Harley Reynolds uses a Bangalore torpedo, again to blow a, a hole through the wire, start to move up these bluffs. Reynolds' group from B Company is going to head in this direction, curve around uh, to, the, to the west and cause problems for the Germans uh, in the course of the day. There are going to be engineers who are working with um, mine detecting equipment or sometimes just down on their hands and knees with bayonets or, or whatever uh, to find mines, to, to sweep uh, little pathways in the mines and then lay down tape. And it's usually about two to three feet or two to three yards wide. Uh, and then you'll have columns of troops eventually in the course of the day who are going to go up those perilous um, cleared paths. Um, you have, oops, a little farther to the east, WN60 and 61. You remember I mentioned 60 where you can have this panoramic view of Omaha Beach. 61 where you're almost down on the beach if you're a German defender. There's about 14 of them at uh, 61. Um, you've got the problem here for a third battalion. These are cliffs, okay? So it's great. You're at these cliffs. You're underneath WN60 and, you know, they, they can't shoot at you down there. That's true, but the tides are coming in. And if you stay in there long enough, you're literally going to get engulfed. <laughs> so you've, once you've landed, and I said about a half hour, 45 minutes late, and it was a tough landing because as you're coming ashore, they can shoot at you there until you're right there at the cliff. Make sense? So um, what you have to do then is hook around here and attack straight up. And the great Joe Balkoski, I think is still the greatest historian of Omaha Beach, described this, I think, very aptly as a natural amphitheater. And that's precisely what it is as you go up WN60. Notice a lot of it's mined. Notice they have machine guns brooding down here, little nests and whatnot. So you kind of got to attack straight up. And the survivors of 3rd Battalion, largely organized by a guy named Captain Kimball Richmond, who was one of the company commanders, highly respected, um, and functions as a sort of de facto battalion commander of the, the remnants of three rifle companies to send them up here in this sort of left hook uh, attack supported by a couple of tanks down here on the beach and then uh, forge the way in, neutralize a lot of WN60 and then move in this direction. Perhaps the most famous guy who's involved in that side of it is Lieutenant Jimmy Monteith uh, from Richmond, Virginia uh, who will fight quite valorously in the course of the day, uh, ultimately be killed staving off a German counterattack and earn the Medal of Honor. Um, so these are the people who kind of uh, uh, secure the eastern flank and that's important because if the Germans continue to hold that flank, they'll rake all of Omaha Beach with fire. Um, so it's still a little controversial whether WN60 is knocked out by like late morning or whether parts of it are still in service throughout the day. Um, I think it's the, the latter is more likely, but I wouldn't claim that as a 100% fact. Uh, but there's no doubt you're not getting much fire from it by about midday or early afternoon. Um, down closer to the beach, Staff Sergeant Ray uh, Strajny, 25-year-old guy from uh, Taunton, Massachusetts, um, notices that a 50-millimeter pedestal gun is just, just wreaking havoc on incoming landing craft uh, and, and uh, soldiers along here, along Easy Red. Uh, so he grabs a bazooka uh, and basically has this duel with the gun, fires about six shots uh, with very little support. The bazooka was damaged, too. Um, detonates the ammunition 
not really the gun, but the ammunition nearby, and this probably forces the German defenders to say, hey, I don't want any more of this. Uh, and then he leads another group to, to basically overrun WN61. So the 88 millimeter gun is gone, the 50 millimeter gun is gone, and you control WN61, as, as he will later put it, my superiors were dead or wounded. His, uh, his lieutenant, Otto Clemens, had been killed on the beach. He said, someone had to take over. I had lots of combat experience, all relied on me. And in a way, that's kind of the, the sort of experience core of the Big Red One. Um, there were two particular groups that I argue has, have the most effect. Um, one led by this man, Lieutenant John Spaulding, second from right. There's a picture with his brothers. Um, and this man, Tech Sergeant Phil Stresick, is his ranking NCO. These two guys come from different uh, backgrounds in civilian life. Um, Spaulding was a former sports writer from Owensboro, Kentucky. Um, he had written a, a book called, or a, a column called Sports Sparks, the Owensboro Messenger Inquirer. Um, he had joined the Army as a private, had earned a commission through OCS. He had a wife and child back home. And he was a new guy. He was 29 years old. He was new to combat that day. Stracek was one of the most heavily combat experienced guys in the entire Big Red One. Um, he was a, sort of a child of the Depression from a big Polish-American family of 10 kids in New Jersey. Had had to leave school after eighth grade because times were tough. He had uh, joined the Army and, of course, as I mentioned, had fought with the Big Red One since North Africa. Um, they are one of the few boat sections to land in the right place. They land um, an easy red in a dead spot on the German defenses. It doesn't mean it's easy. They land in deep water. They have a little bit of a tough water landing, but they get ashore more or less intact. Um, and uh, they are able to, if we go back, oops, now that you've seen them, oops. They are able to basically head in this direction. If you've ever taken the, the pathway uh, from the cemetery down to the beach, that's roughly speaking uh, the path that the Spalding group follows. Spalding and Stresa group uh, landed easy red, come in here, and then they snake over towards WN64. Um, they are, I believe, the first uh, American group of any size to get off Omaha Beach uh, on D-Day. And they probably do as much or more than anyone to completely neutralize WN-64. Now that's important because uh, WN-64 can lay down a lot of fire on all these reinforcing groups that are coming in at Easy Red. Uh, so when the Spalding group keeps them busy and destroys a lot of those fortifications throughout the course of the morning and the early afternoon, uh, it takes that asset away from the Germans. Um, these guys fight very hard in the course of the day. There's 32 men in the group. Two were killed, eight were wounded. Uh, the Army later awarded seven of them Distinguished Service Crosses, including Spalding and Stresek. Um, they conclude the day fighting around Colville in the, in the um, hedgerows nearby. Also, another group oops, led by Captain Joe Dawson, commander of G Company 16th Infantry on D-Day, and he was a new commander and felt he had to prove himself. He was resented because the previous commander, Captain Ed Wozenski, was, was revered. Uh, Dawson was the new guy. He had been a staff officer, he'd seen combat, but he had never led a company. He was a 30-year-old guy from, uh, from Waco, uh, Texas. He was the, uh, the son of a prominent Baptist minister. He had earned a degree from Baylor. He had already worked in the oil business before the war. Um, and he has in his mind this idea of proving himself, uh, being up to the task. And so Dawson is determined to lead, to truly lead on D-Day. His G Company comes in about 20 minutes after Spalding and company, and they follow the same path through. They head in the other direction towards Colville. Uh, so in a way, it's what a, these, are, these two groups are what I call a knife in the vitals against the Germans, heading in different directions off the beach. Um, Dawson takes about 60 casualties in his company during the landing. But they're mostly lightly wounded. Most of G Company is intact. To follow him, he personally destroys at least one machine gun nest. He fights it out, uh, he and two other men, with a German group within the church in Colville once they get there. Um, he personally leads and is wounded throughout the course of the day, and I think it's fair to say G Company does as much damage uh, to the Germans as, as any other unit at Omaha Beach on D-Day. Um, and then really the, the prime example I would show you is Colonel George Taylor. Um, Colonel George Taylor is a 45-year-old West Point trained officer. Uh, he's the commander of the 16th Infantry, and he knows a lot about amphibious invasions. Now, he lands uh, about an oh, hour and a half, two hours after H hour. 
uh, when things are not in very good shape. His XO had already been killed, landing about a half an hour earlier, Lieutenant Colonel John Matthews. Um, and I think, uh, you know, when Taylor comes ashore, he, his strength is he's able to diagnose what's going on and prescribe solutions. Um, the most famous term associated with Omaha Beach, I think, I think you could argue, is the phrase, only two kinds of people are going to be on this beach, the dead and those who are going to die. Well, it's Taylor who says that, and he says it repeatedly, over and over and over again on D-Day morning. And of course, that's where the title of the book comes from, obviously, because uh, I think that's what encapsulates the Omaha Beach fight. One of the things I found out, and I found out here at the McCormick Research Center, um, I found a memo that Taylor had written in September of 43, and it proves that that phrase, the dead and those who are going to die, uh, was not new in his mind on D-Day morning. He'd been thinking about it since September because he wrote it in that memo. So when it comes to amphibious landings, only two classes of men on a beach, the dead and those who are going to die. So when he comes ashore, he's more or less obsessed with this notion of getting people off that beach. Uh, and so he circulates around, much of Easy Red and Fox Green, just constantly saying this. Um, and I found all sorts of eyewitness accounts of people who saw that and in many cases were motivated by him to do just that. Um, this is Taylor's greatest contribution that morning. Um, and one of the things I think that's unfortunate, in The Longest Day, they have those words spoken by a different person. Uh, Robert Mitchum's character is General Norman Dutch Coda, who was the second in command of the 29th Division in the, in the Western Sector, and they have him saying that. And I th really think that's unfortunate uh, because those words belong to Taylor. Um, that, that it's, it's sort of his concept. Not that he's the only one who knows this, but I think he, more than anybody, uh, walks that walk, uh, quite literally. And so his contribution is that he's able, to obviously, to save a lot of lives by motivating people to get off the beach where they're quite vulnerable. Think of it this way. When you're an American soldier at Omaha Beach, on the beach, you are a target. When you're inland, you're probably a hunter. Um, and you are a real threat to the Germans. That's how you're going to win. The only way they're going to win is to pin you down on that beach in perpetuity. Okay, so Taylor understands that. So that's one. Second, um, those initial groups that got off the beach, Spalding and Streisick and uh, 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 excuse me, <laughs> Dylan, Dylan, Reynolds, I mean, you name it, all those groups, um, they needed reinforcement. They were vulnerable to counterattack. There weren't that many of them. So when Taylor does his thing, it allows um, the, the Americans to put more pressure on the Germans. Uh, and this is really decisive by late morning and early afternoon on D-Day. So um, it's an overstatement to say that Omaha Beach is secured at that point, but it's really just a matter of time. The perilous hours were the first two to four hours or so. Um, there's, of course, a lot more to the rest of the story. The landing of the 18th Infantry, uh, the overwhelming of WN-62, uh, the taking of a beach exit called whoops called um, E1, which is over here, um, all those kind of things. The establishment of the beachhead, troubled resupply landings, engineers, medics, all of this kind of stuff. Um, but of course, for that you have to read the book. Um, by nightfall on the longest day, this is your situation. Uh, you've carved out a, a shaky lodgment. It's really not front lines; it's perimeters. Um, you have succeeded. You've overwhelmed these defenses here. You've got engineers now building the roads. That's a tough job. Um, the, it's been uh, very costly. The Big Red One has suffered at least 300 killed. That's a lowball estimate on my part. I went through all the um, uh, morning reports and, you know, to find out exactly how many people were casualties. Uh, and it's about 1,100 to 1,300 in the course of the day for the division. That doesn't include the attached people. Gap assault teams, the tankers, and whatnot. That's probably about 500 more. Um, but obviously, you've paid a heavy price. Uh, the emotional toll it took on the survivors, who were considered heroes by their country, also substantial. Um, uh, Stresik, for instance, um, of course, D-Day is one of many heavy days in combat for him. Eventually, in the Hurricane Forest, months later, he's evacuated with combat fatigue. Um, he's discharged from the Army. And this is, this is sort of the postscript. The Stresik uh, Spalding group, by the way, is fairly well known, but the rest of the story is not. Uh, Stresik went back to civilian life, got married, had four kids, became a builder in Florida, but he lived with painful physical wounds and terrible war-related nightmare and trauma. And, and in 1957, he took his own life. Um, John Spalding uh, also saw many more months of combat. He was also combat wounded. He was evacuated with combat fatigue. Uh, he went home to, uh, to Kentucky. 
Uh, he got divorced from his wife, uh, but he remarried in 1946, had three more kids with her, got elected to the Kentucky State Legislature, uh, had a good job in a, as a manager in a department store, kind of settles in as a local war hero. Uh, but in, in what, an incident that's still shrouded in mystery, in, uh, in 1959, after an argument, uh, his wife shot him to death, and John Spalding died at the age of 44 years old. Uh, and certainly there's some sort of vestige of trauma, I think, that comes from Omaha Beach that you can still see all those many years later. Now, these guys are not typical, of course, in their actions at Omaha Beach and in their post-war lives, but it does show that there is a, a mark left. Uh, and even for those who had happy lives like Dawson, Omaha Beach stayed with them forever. He will later write to his family, what little satisfaction gained from it has been the belief that it was all worthwhile. And this was shared by our loved ones uh, and those who represent our nation. If they had failed, well, as Paul pointed out, the Normandy invasion is probably going to be uh, really in peril. You're talking about two allied beachheads that the Germans can perhaps defeat or destroy in detail. But the political consequences would have been enormous. In an election year here in 1944, the Churchill government, uh, the diplomatic standing in Germany, all those kinds of things are in play. Uh, so obviously there's a lot at stake at Omaha Beach. Why did they succeed? Not just because of their experience. It's not just that. Uh, the 29th Division fights very well and it's brand new. Um, it's a little more than that. Um, there's General Huebner, in spite of the fact that the plan was flawed and it didn't work out as, as envisioned, had trained the division to a winning standard. There was a muscle memory there. Uh, people respected their leaders, they knew their weapons, they knew there were enough of them who knew what to do under these key circumstances. Um, that eventually makes the difference. Um, it's as if the coach, Hubner, has designed a playbook, but of course he's totally disengaged from the battle because he's aboard ship most of the day. It's the, the junior officers and the junior soldiers, the players, who have to carry out the play uh, and improvise on it. And they do that. The Streesix, the Dawsons, the Richmonds, the Reynolds, all of these people uh, do just that. Um, so Hubner doesn't come ashore until D-Day evening. Uh, and when he does, uh, he's briefed by one of Taylor's staff officers about the events of the day. And Hubner was another one, just like Dawson, who felt that, you know, he hadn't established that relationship or that trust with his guys yet. But he felt D-Day had been that turning point for him, he will later say. And as he listens to this briefing, He's, he's deeply moved, deeply impressed with the resolve of his people, the resourcefulness of the division, and uh, he has tears in his eyes. And the, the staff officer finishes. Uh, the tears are still in Hubner's eyes. And he looks at the staff officer and he says, with deep admiration, he says this twice, he says, you did it. And I think seven decades later, that still says it all. Thank you. Yes, sir. That's what I was about to say. Ah, great, great. Yeah. Okay. Oh, this one's You've working. We've got a lab, so we'll, we'll toss this to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here, JD, if you do the honors, I'll hop over on this side if we have to. How much, how much uh, was the deception? that the Allies were able to, to uh, come across because the Germans, because I've read a, quite a few history books now, the Germans had concentrated a lot of their troops and that and artillery and so on in a spot where they thought the invasion was going to be and it wasn't. Mm -hmm. So, it, uh, it was, oh yeah, Rommel went back to visit his wife because it was his birthday, her birthday and all this. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, well, they aren't going to, they aren't going to invade. And then, oops, then, then I'll tell you, that they, uh, it was only because of superior uh, manpower and not because they had better equipment. It was the superior manpower and just uh, good leadership mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that, that they were able to, to get in there and get behind them so they right. could knock out the pillboxes. Right. Yeah. That was the key to the whole thing. Now, that, I think the deception you're alluding to has to do with Calais. Uh, that the Germans have, have heavily defended Calais, because that's the obvious landing point in France. It's so close to England, you've got a lot of port cities there, there's good beaches that can hold armor and other vehicles. Um, you're close to the, the uh, road net of uh, the low ground road net in Europe, it's close to the industrial ruhr in Germany. 
Uh, but of course, that's why it's so heavily defended. So Normandy is sort of the second choice, but the Allies hope to deceive the Germans into thinking the invasion will come at Calais. And to some extent, that's successful, Operation Fortitude. Uh, so what you want to do in Normandy is isolate the battlefield uh, to make sure there aren't that many Germans there at the beach to deal with you while you're vulnerable in the water. Uh, and it is, to some extent, Omaha Beach and the other beaches are a question of just throwing a lot of stuff and people there and overwhelming them. And, and to some extent, that's what happens at Omaha Beach, por partially. Yes, this is my question for my husband. Um, how do we know that the Germans in, I believe, WN62, were they living or dead? Um, you mean by the end of the day, right? <laughs> um. Um, how do you know what they did? Ah. for or say? Yeah, good question. Uh, several of them did survive. Most notably, two guys, um, Franz Gockel and Heinz Sieberlo. They survived to give their account of exactly what they experienced on D-Day. They were fortunate to survive. Most of, most of the majority of the German defenders of WN62 did not. Uh, but there were enough. There was another guy, I think, named Siegfried Kuska. And these guys did have reunions over the years, believe it or not. Uh, so. There, there were some of them who talked who could give something of the German perspective, but that's, that's still to this day uh, one of the really uh, you know, vexing aspects of it from an historian is that most of the Germans don't survive this, either this or later campaigns in World War II. And so we don't have as much from the German perspective as we would like. But uh, my, my friend and colleague Steve Zaloga has done some great work on that, on the German defenses and the German point of view, and I encourage you to, to read his new book, The Devil's Garden. Uh, question. Um, <clears throat> what was the reason they went with the Higgins boats versus the Amtraks or the LCMs of Elbow and Pacific <laughs> Theater? Uh, I, I think personally it's sort of bureaucratic inertia. This is what they had previously used. The Higgins boat obviously is an important piece of equipment as a shallow draft landing craft. But, um, but you only had so many Amtraks too. Uh, and in, and in, uh, they were really a better, little better designed for the Pacific because you had so many coral reefs for the invasions in the Pacific. In Normandy, you couldn't say that. Uh, so priority for what limited Amtraks you have is going to go to the Pacific. But uh, Amtraks generally are, are a better go in terms of real maneuverable landing craft than the Higgins boats. And maybe they're a little less vulnerable, too, as far as the silhouette, possibly. What pre-invasion uh, training helped and what pre-invasion training uh, didn't help the, uh, the six, uh, for Big Run 1? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, I think the biggest thing that helps is the weapons proficiency. Uh, the ability to have confidence in your weapons, to fire your weapons, to know a lot of different kinds of weapons and to utilize them. Uh, a lot of the weapons when these guys come ashore uh, are choked with sand or fouled with sea salt or whatever. And so they're going to have to pick up anything they can see on the beach. They do this pretty effectively. Um, what fails is uh, artillery coordination. Uh, I tend to think, and again, this is, this is only my opinion, I understand others might disagree. Um, I tend to think uh, all of this idea of working with the artillery and bringing them ashore and, and training to do that for this invasion is completely useless. Um, the, the artillery is not going to be in play throughout D-Day at all. It's not likely to be in play given how difficult the defenses are at Omaha Beach, and the Navy is your built-in artillery. So there much, should have been much better emphasis on communicating with the Navy because when you see uh, naval destroyers offshore who know what to shoot at and where, they're going to be really effective on D-Day. When they don't, sometimes they're a menace. Um, so that's, that to me is the, the sort of the, what, what, what might have been your most useless training um, in preparation for D-Day. Uh, regarding the Navy, uh, my dad served in the Navy and he was on a destroyer at Point de Hoc mm. assisting the Rangers. About two hours later, closer to eight, the Navy was asked to get involved and come around to Omaha. Mm. I know that they played a big part in that, but the early part they stayed out of it at the beginning to support the troops themselves on the, in the ocean. What do you think the role of the Navy had to do with this? Um, I think the Navy's role is really significant in the course of the day and should have been more significant uh, because you've got, one, you've got an absolutely effective, devastating weapon in these destroyers. The five-inch guns how, and how close these, these destroyers can come and the fact that, I'm not going to say they're invulnerable to German fire, but 
Omaha Beach is mainly ground defensive weapons. It's not long sur mer down the coast that's naval weapons designed to shoot at ships. Uh, so it's not as if you're invulnerable in a, in a destroyer, but nonetheless, that's an outstanding weapons platform. And you do see the USS Frankfurt, I think, is the best example. USS Frankfurt comes in fairly close, about 1,000 yards or so, uh, and hits that uh, pillbox at WN65, oh, you know, about 11.30 in the morning. And there's still a lot of argument to this day. What really KOs that pillbox? Is it Frankfurt? Is it uh, the, the um, uh, anti-aircraft units that are in there shooting at it? Is it tanks or whatever? Yes, yes, and yes. But Frankfurt probably does administer the, the ultimate killing blow. And you can even look at it in the pillbox today. You can see the top part of it is just, just wrecked off of there, and only naval gunfire really could have done that. Uh, so that's just one instance. There's another instance of WN-60, when one of the other destroyers uh, somehow manages to communicate with Jimmy Monteith and his group uh, and do some pretty major damage to those defenses there. Uh, so I tend to feel that's a missed opportunity. Uh, the Navy's role should have been developed a bit more. I'd like to know, when these young men got into the Higgins boat, how many hours had they already <laughs> been up? So um, that this was a very long day for them. It is an extremely long day. They're probably up since about 3 or 4 in the morning. And who knows how many of them really slept the night before. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's <laughs> it depends on the individual anecdotes, I suppose. They're fed the, the pre-invasion meal. And that varied from steak and eggs to here's some slop. You know, here's some rations or, or here's what we've got. Um, it really did vary. But uh, how many people could really eat uh, or could really focus and concentrate uh, so by the time you hit the beach at, uh, what, 6.30, 7, something like that, you've probably been up about four hours or so. Mm -hmm. But a lot of that has been spent in your landing craft, I would say at least two hours or so. I had an uncle that w rode in one of the Higgins boats, and he said most of the men were throwing up all over each other. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of sickness, a lot of seasickness, and just discomfort. Just You can imagine yourself on this rocking boat with, packed with 31 other guys and the weapons and just kind of bumping all over one another. Not very comfortable. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. How uh, good were the, uh, the lines of communication between Hubner's staff on the boats and the gentlemen that are on the beach? I mean, I'm, I'm assuming not very well, right? Uh, that's, that's a great question, and it's, it's really something I should have addressed. Um, Hubner is like a caged lion in the course of the day. He's aboard ship, and he's, just, he's getting these very fragmentary reports. Communications are not good at all. And so he's getting these reports, many of which are quite troubling, and he's just dying to get in there and do something about it. His chief of staff, Stan Hope Mason, has to almost physically restrain him uh, from going ashore because he basically says, you're just going to be lost in the maw and then we're going to be worse off because it's chaotic there. Your boat could get blown up. You could be out of communication with your division. It could be even worse than now. Uh, and so communications are tremendously spotty in the course of the day. One of the turning points come comes when uh, General Willard Wyman, who's his assistant division commander, who comes in after Taylor at 8.39 in the morning, um, and also kind of goes up and down the beach organizing things. He's a major figure, too. Um, he discerns that, okay, we don't need more vehicles and stuff and whatever. We need people. We need infantry here to deal with this situation. He's able to get a report as such, and, a, and almost an order, up to, to Hubner which allows him to, to, at about 10.30, 11 in the morning, give orders to send in the 18th Infantry. And that's one thing that puts even more pressure on the Germans and kind of buckles their defenses. But uh, by the time Hubner comes ashore at uh, about, about 7 in the evening or so, uh, he really has only the most sketchy idea as to what's gone on in the course of the day. He knows there's a beachhead, and that's really kind of about it. So, and, of course, Bradley and, and uh, Giro, Bradley, the 1st Army commander, and Giro, the 5th Corps commander, his superiors, in a way, no, no even less. Just some, I'm just curious about the terrain in the area, mm. particularly with the F1 draw. So it looks like to me that those draw, there really isn't any rows leading up there. There just were some, nope. but, so it really was just kind of this ambiguous 
space that they just kind of crawled up? Pretty much. It's, a, it's like, here's cliffs, and then the cliffs kind of eventually give way to an embankment. It's okay, so they kind of higher than you are tall, kind of thing. Okay, so they kind of yeah they dissipate, go down to an embankment, then you go up that embankment, you and go then up here. But it's, go, it's okay. It's very undefined. It's like here's an embankment and here's a little indentation. Let's climb through there and try and improve <laughs> upon that. And you know one of the things that the records say, and you know this happens a lot uh, doing <sighs> research like this. The records will say something, and you just put it through your mind and be like, that doesn't make sense. How mm -hmm. could that be? Because they talk about Monteith going back to the beach down here and then leading two tanks off the beach. Well, you take one look at that embankment, you're like, how in the world would a Sherman tank get over that embankment without tipping over? I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that all sources are unanimous that somehow with Monteith <coughs> leading the way in what probably was a mine infested area, that he's able to get these tanks somehow up here to have an impact on WN60 in this direction. So. You've got this amphitheater, and then you've got a lot of bramble and ravine and, uh, and kind of hilly ground. And then you've got this embankment here that gives way to that narrow shingle beach. And okay. then, of course, cliffs over there. Okay. And then in E1, it's a similar thing. It's the draw is not necessarily have any roads. It's just like a... It doesn't. Uh, okay. Not a real road. And that's, and that's the major road that the engineers are going to build. And it's, okay. uh, the vestiges over there are there today. That's where you're going to like park your car. Uh, there's a little road today that comes down uh, close to WN62 that wouldn't have been there on D-Day. Okay. That's, that's the thing in the, the first division sector, you really don't have any obvious roads, so it's quite an engineer's job to deal with that. Whereas in the 29th sector, there was at least a coastal road that you could improve upon and use as a foundation from an engineer standpoint. Thank you. The maps in this book are great. Oh, I think thanks. They're, they're super informative. Rick Britton is the cartographer, and he's an amazing talent. Um, how difficult was it to, for the infantry to get up the bluffs? Because I, I know Spalding's group and G Company mm -hmm. were able to get off that way, but how difficult was it for everyone else to get up those bluffs? It's, it's very difficult for everybody. Uh, it's a tough physical climb in a way, and I don't mean a climb like mountain climbing. I mean like uphill, kind of stooped over, watching your footing because it's so uneven kind of climb and it just kind of steadily upward and then that brooding ridge, prominent ridge line, the cemetery is just over it today. Uh, that ridge line that's sort of looking over everything that you can kind of crest the ridge perhaps. This is, this is a, a sort of universal experience for many of the infantrymen who are leaving Omaha Beach in the course of the day, not just in the first division. Um, and it, but the, the, the problem you're going to have to deal with obviously is the mines. Um, and it, for the re if you're like part of the 18th infantry, coming in at midday and later, that's the biggest thing you're going to worry about besides shell fire, is the mines, and a lot of people are getting wounded by the mines. So for any, any infantry soldier who comes in in the course of the day, there is at least that physical challenge and the, and the constant issue of mines that you're going to have to deal with. Okay, that was the bonus question. Not ah, great. <laughs>